Murphy. I'm glad you could join us. We have a very special guest here in this next session. I'm joined today by Merck McCuriartis, who is one of the leading figures in the music industry today. Merck started his career in the 1980s at Virgin Records, where over time, he worked his way up to become the CEO of the Sanctuary Group and managed the careers of Beyonce, Elton John, Kiss, and Iron Maiden, just to name a few. In 2017, he started his own company, which I'm sure you are all familiar with, called Hypnosis Songs Fund. Hypnosis offers investors the chance to make money off the royalties generated from the songs of hundreds of artists. The catalog includes hit songs from Blondie, Beyonce, Timbaland, Journey, and recently the Red Hot Chili Peppers and producer Andrew Watts, to name a few. This is the first company to establish songs as an asset class recognized on the FTSE 250 and establish the role of song management to enhance the value of these great catalogs. I'm looking forward to learning more about hypnosis in today's session. So, Merck, thank you for joining us. It's a pleasure. Hi, everyone. Hi, Chris. Great to be with you. Great. So, you know, before we get started in talking about the, you know, all the dealings of hypnosis, I think we should bring it back to the early days. You know, a lot of our audience is comprised of students and young professionals kind of making their way into the industry. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the early days of your career at Virgin Records and how it progressed leading up to the Sanctuary Group. Sure, of course. Um, I mean, I love talking to students because I'm a, a, a great example that you can manifest anything in life that you want to manifest. You know, so I, I went from kissing a girl at age 14 for the first time, listening to an Elton John record to managing Elton John. Um, but, you know, really, I was just someone that was obsessed with music. Um, I was also, you know, probably riddled with anxiety in general in terms of being shy, you know, you know, needing to find real reasons to get out of bed. And what I eventually found out was that my love of music and my obsession with it and wanting to be a part of it was more important to me than whatever those anxieties were were about. And I made it my mission to 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 become a part of it. And it, it really came from um, at a very young age, you know, it, like still in single digits, you know, seven, eight, nine years old, knowing that I would never be a performer or an artist. And I'd sit there and I'd listen to, you know, Neil Young records and Cat Stevens records and Jimi Hendrix records. And, you know, I knew that that I wasn't going to be one of those guys, you know, and, and I therefore started to to figure out by reading who the people were that surrounded those guys and girls and what roles they played and started to figure out a, a, a role for myself. And what I found was that, you know, Virgin Records was my favorite record company in terms of the artists that it was putting out. You know, it was putting out everything from, you know, Mike Oldfield and Tangerine Dream to, you know, the Sex Pistols and XTC. And, you know, by the time I went to work for Virgin Records, it was, you know, the band that I championed and was in love with was Simple Minds. But it was an incredible era. We had Simple Minds, Culture Club, UB40, the Blue Nile, Orchestral Maneuvers in the Dark, the Human League. Um, and I went to work for Virgin because I felt that it was the, the most artist-friendly record company uh, there was. And uh, I wasn't, so, I was in my teens still, um, you know, younger than, 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 than probably most of you guys and, and, uh, and girls. And I wasn't sophisticated enough to realize that, in fact, I was, even though it was an artist friendly record company, I wasn't working for the artist. I was working for Richard Branson. And while there was a lot of alignment between what Richard Branson, what was good for Richard Branson and what was good for the band, crucially, there were times where there wasn't alignment, you know, and I found myself erring on the side of what the band wanted. I wanted to work for the band. I didn't want to work for a company. Um, so uh, I was lucky enough to figure that out. It took me four years. I was lucky to have success along the way, marketing bands like Simple Minds, as I say, and, and Orchestral Maneuvers and the Human League and UB40 and, and, and many others. Um, so I, I knew these two guys that were managing Iron Maiden and Iron Maiden was having its first real blush of success. Um, and I thought they were great managers. And I, I went to them. I said, listen, I, I've had this epiphany. I'm, I'm not supposed to work for a record company. I'm supposed to work for the artist and I want to be a manager. And they were both 15 years older than I was. And, uh, you know, as I say, Iron Maiden was having its, its first real success. 
Um, so they were looking to give up some responsibility. One of them was, you know, going to get married and start having a family. The other one was just wanting to be on the road with the band the entire time. And I've, I, of course, was looking to soak up responsibility. And, and these two guys were incredibly influential in my career because one of them was completely business. He hated sport. They'd both been best friends at Cambridge University. Um, one of them you know, was, as I say, completely business. He hated sports. He knew nothing about creativity. Um, you know, the only two things that, that these guys had in common, the other one loved sports, was totally creative, knew nothing about business in general terms. The only thing they had in common was that they could drink like crazy. Um, and they were the perfect complement to each other. And I became the kind of bastard offspring of both these guys, a mixture of, of, of business and creativity, and particularly how to take those two things and, you know, figure out how to, to uh, uh, you know, put them together so that an artist's commerce was maximized, um, but that their art was compromised in the least way possible. Because that's, you know, ultimately at the end of the day is as whether you're an artist, whether you're a songwriter, you know, whether you're a manager, um, you know, the, the, the balance is, you know, how can you, you know, turn this into a, 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 a great way for you to make a living while at the same time being proud of the work that you've created and that you're a part of. Um, and uh, gratefully, I learned how to do it very well. And, you know, I, you know, I suppose the, 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 the sort of common threads to my career are it's always been integrity led. I, I never make decisions that are based on money. I make decisions that are based on what's the right thing to do for the music. I'm, I'm here to serve the artist. I'm here to serve the song. I'm here to serve the music. The decisions that I make are all completely based on, 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 on that. Um, and uh, uh, I've found, you know, in, in the almost 40 years that I've been doing this, that if you make decisions that are in the best interest of the art, the money will find you somehow. Yeah, I, mean, I completely agree. I mean, the music always comes first. And I guess in your case, you know, this is kind of something that's been bubbling in the back of your head, thinking about the art of songwriting, right? So I'm curious from a management and label standpoint, what originally piqued your interest um, in dedicating your efforts, you know, towards songwriters and, and what makes a good songwriter to you? So when I, when I started my career, you know, 90% of the artists that would be signed were people that, you know, were similar to Simple Minds and Iron Maiden. Um, you know, I call it the post Beatles paradigm um, where, you know, they had a good idea of who they were. They had a good idea of who they were going to become. Um, they knew, you know, what their album cover should look like, what their stage show should look like. They wrote their own songs. The purpose for someone like me was to believe in them. And then to figure out a way of making other people believe in them and making those ideas, you know, become a reality. Um, today, 90% of the artists that are being signed are almost always reliant on an outside songwriter. There, there hasn't been a Billboard Top 100 album of the year since 2014, Bob Dylan's last studio album, but one that was a top 100 album of the year that didn't have an outside songwriter on it. So today, you know, whether you're Coldplay or whether you're Dua Lipa, there's an outside songwriter on pretty much every song that, 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 that you're delivering. And what I noticed was that, and this goes back now to this paradigm starting, um, you know, probably 15 years ago, where I was managing great songwriters alongside the great artists that I was managing, people like, um, you know, Diane Warren, who may be the most successful songwriter of all time, The Dream, um, you know, Berkeley alumni, uh, Justin Tranter. Um, and, uh, you know, th these people were, were delivering the most important component to a record company and an artist having success, and yet they weren't getting their fair share of the pie. And when I started to in investigate why songwriters, you know, because obviously when you're the when you're the artist and you're the songwriter together, the disparity between those two things isn't really something that you pay too much attention to because you're looking at the pool of money as opposed to isolated income streams. When you're looking at a, a songwriter, you know, that it that doesn't have 
live income coming in or a master royalty coming in or name and likeness rights or merchandising or these other um, uh, uh, income streams that you want to develop for artists, you know, you start to really recognize that there's a massive disparity because, you know, we're nothing without the song, right? The, you know, if, if you wear, if you wear a band's t-shirt or an artist t-shirt, it's because you love their songs. If you pay money to go see them play live, it's because you love their songs. If you own their records or, or stream them, it's because you love their songs. So at, at, at the root, the currency of our business is the song. And yet the songwriter is the low man or woman, you know, in the economic equation. And the more I recognized this, the more I was determined to not only do something about it, but to make it the focus of, 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 of my career. Um, because, you know, what I came to realize, and this is quite controversial, is that the reason why the songwriter is the low man or woman in the economic equation is because the three biggest song companies in the world, being Universal, Warner, and Sony, and EMI, when there was a fourth major, um, didn't advocate for songwriters because they were owned by the three biggest recorded music companies in the world. And on the recorded music side of the business, they're getting four-fifths of the revenue, they're getting an 80% gross margin, a 40% net margin. And in general, they own those assets in perpetuity. Very few people realize that there are not many recording artists that actually own their own recordings. They're almost all owned by the record company. If you conversely look at the song side of the business, the publishing side of the business, you've got uh, a fifth of the income, you've got a fifth of the margin, and quite rightly, um, you know, the songs end up back in the hands of the people that co-created them, whether that is through, you know, reversions or renegotiations or good management and lawyering in the first place, you know, the songs end up back in the people in the hands of the people that co-wrote them in the song in the hands of the songwriters. So Universal, Warner and Sony, they use their leverage of their recorded music companies owning and controlling their publishing companies to silence those three companies from advocating for songwriters. So what should be the three loudest voices are, are, are moot. Um, and they do that because they wanna push all of the money towards recorded music where the lion's share is theirs, right? So if you look at a dollar, if you look at a dollar's worth of Spotify or Apple income, 30 cents goes to Apple or Spotify, uh, which is, you know, you can make an argument that that 30 cents should become 27 cents or 25 cents. And I'm, I'm sure it will eventually, but ultimately it's still a pretty fair slice of the pie considering that they've saved the music industry and that they are, you know, dealing with, you know, 450 million paid subscribers around the world that now have access to our music. Um, but whether that 30 cents becomes 27 cents or 25 cents isn't really the material point. The material point is what happens to the other 70 cents. And the other 70 cents currently is 58 and a half cents going to the record company. They pay most artists on a sale rather than a license. If they paid them on a license, which is what they should be doing, um, then they would have to give them half of that 58 and a half cents. But by paying them on a sale, they get away with only giving them nine cents or so on the dollar, right? So they're, right. Clearing, they're clearing 50 cents on every dollar, leaving 11 and a half cents to be shared amongst the four or five songwriters and more sometimes on a song and their publishing companies. So the people that are getting, you know, that are delivering the most important component, the song, are getting fractions of a penny, literally fractions of a penny on every dollar, right? While the record company is clearing 50 cents. So I wanted, when I recognized this, I also recognized that, you know, they could swap me like a fly on the wall, regardless of the fact that I'd had a nice career and that I managed great artists and great songwriters, because I didn't have the financial wherewithal and the platform and the leverage to go to war with them. Um, so I went out and I created it. And, you know, that that's hypnosis. So hypnosis is a uh, it's a purpose driven company and it has a motive 
as I've explained it to my shareholders from day one, and it equally has an ulterior motive, which I've explained to my shareholders from, from day one. And, and the motive is very clear, which is that this is a great way to make money. Songs are, you know, give very proven, predictable income at a point in time when streaming is, is blowing the record business back up again. And at the same time, the ulterior motive is to use the leverage that I now have, you know, having built a multi-billion dollar company to change where the songwriter sits in the economic equation. Absolutely. And I love to hear that, you know, right as we were saying before we went on is, you know, I think hypnosis represents a very bright light for, for the future of the music industry. Um, but in terms of, you know, uh, shareholder value, in terms of making revenues from the value of these songs, it's obviously very dependent on careful song selection. So I was wondering if you can kind of walk us through kind of the process on how you identify which songs you're going to include under the hypnosis umbrella uh, to actual execution of the deal and incorporating them in the company. I'm, I'm sure that, that, you know, the students understand the kind of Mal Malcolm Gladwell philosophy of putting your 10,000 hours in, right? Sure. So imagine I've been listening to music nonstop, day in, day out, you know, from the time that I was three years old. I'm now 57 years old. So for 54 years, I've been doing nothing but listening to music, right? I, I, know, I know nothing. Everything that I know about life, I learned through music. Right. I learned, you know, I, I didn't go to you know university and, and I'm not discouraging anyone from going to university, particularly a place like Berkeley. Um, but, you know, what I know about life, I learned from Neil Young's records. Right. The, the you know, the, the first, uh, you know, encounter of empathy for me is being four or five years old, listening to In the Ghetto by Elvis Presley, the great Mac Davis song. And for the first time ever you know, realizing that actually not everyone had it perfect in the, the same way that, that maybe it felt like life was perfect to me. I learned about drugs in, in Neil Young records, Needle and the Damage Done. I learned about, uh, um, you know, that kind of, you know, Old Man is a, a, a really important song for me in terms of a, a connection that I feel with, 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 you know, people in general, but particularly my father. I learned about, you know, uh, you know, everything from transvesticism to drugs from Lou Reed, you know, The Clash, Patti Smith, um, you know, it's, it's music is a, a complete education. So for me, the choices that I make are based on two things only. One, was the music extraordinarily successful? And two, is it of great cultural importance, right? So those are the two things that um, you know, that, you know, I, my purpose was, 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 you know, when you get past the motive and the ulterior motive, there were three key objectives. One was to establish songs as an asset class, right? Um, awesome. I obviously chose the public market to do that because it's the most prestigious way to demonstrate that. It allows me to compare songs with golden oil because of their predictability and their reliability all assets available on the public market. Equally well, it allows me to say that they're better than golden oil because the revenues from songs are not correlated to what's happening in the world. When there's upheaval in the world, the price of golden oil can be affected, but you know, it never affects the price of songs because if people are living their best lives, they're doing it to a soundtrack of songs. Equally well, if uh, they're experiencing the sort of challenges that we've experienced over the past 15 or 16 months, they're escaping and they're taking comfort with songs. But that one of, the, one of the key things that allows you to establish songs as an asset class is that they're protected by rule of law. And that rule of law in general is 70 years after the death of the last co-composer. Um, and that is not identical everywhere around the world, but in general, that's the law. Uh, and it's improving in places like China where it's not that, et cetera. But, Going back to your question, tying that into your, your question in terms of, of, you know, how do you make the choices and, and, you know, what's important to you, when I take that combination of extraordinary success and cultural importance, um, then you probably end up in a scenario 
where you're going to have something that lasts for 70 years after the death of the last co-composer, right? Because there are a lot of records that are being made that no one's going to be talking about in 20 years time or 50 years time or 70 years time. I'm focused on the records that I do believe people will be talking about. So, you know, when you look at, at, at our catalog, which includes everything from the greatest works of Timbaland to Neil Young to Lindsey Buckingham and Fleetwood Mac to Mark Ronson to Nile Rodgers and Sheik, uh, who is a very proud uh, uh, doctorate of, 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 of Berkeley, um, you know, straight through to, to um, you know, the Eurythmics and, you know, all of the, the great songs that Dave Stewart wrote and, 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 you know, so many others, The Dream. You know, when you look at someone like The Dream's catalog, you know, he wrote Single Ladies Put a Ring on It for Beyonce. He wrote uh, Umbrella for Rihanna. He wrote All of the Lights for Kanye West, Holy Grail for Jay-Z, No Church in the Wild for Frank Ocean, Jay-Z and, 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 and Kanye. You know, these are, 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 you know, records of incredible cultural importance, as well as being massive, massive records. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, hypnosis also has a second half of the business, which is song management, which kind of the value, uh, increases the value of these catalogs, which is a fairly new concept to me. It's something I've been learning about more recently. So could you please explain, you know, what is the essence of song management and how hypnosis approaches it? Sure. Um, so, for you so, the editing in the career of an artist, per se. So, you know, hopefully there are a lot of Berkeley students here that, you know, 20 and 30 years from now, we're going to be talking about as having written some of the best songs of their time and maybe some of the best songs of all time. You know, the current publishing model for songs is broken, right? Because the focus is on creating new songs, not on managing great songs, right? So, yeah, and I'm all for new songs, but I'm not for new songs being, man, you know, being created at the expense of, 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 of great songs not being managed properly because the way that these companies work at the moment, they have 20,000 songs per person. They have millions of songs in each company that can't possibly have the bandwidth to be able to manage those songs properly, right? So what happens is those great songs that hit and become successful, they're allowed to languish. So if you go through and you look at great artists on Spotify or on Apple, it's all about one or two songs, despite the fact that that artist might have had, you know, 20 hits because no one's doing anything to put time and energy into managing those songs. And, and these songs, so that we're clear, for anyone that's a songwriter and an artist that writes their own songs or a producer, you know, these are your pension plan, right? If you choose to sell them to someone like me, you're the one that's being paid, right? I only buy from artists, songwriters, and producers. I don't buy from, from publishing companies. I made one deal with a publishing company, but I've made 149 deals directly with songwriters, artists, and producers. So this is your pension plan. You want this these assets to be managed um, uh, the best that they possibly can be. So we operate on 500 songs to 1,000 songs per person, and we are focused on putting those songs in movies, TV commercials, video games, making sure that they're on the right playlists, making sure that songwriters are, new songwriters are interpolating those songs around the world and that, that, that new artists are covering those songs because we're here to add value. And, and, you know, if I take somebody like Al Jackson and I'm using him because he's, you know, a, a great historical figure, the, the, the drummer in Booker T and the MGs, when we bought Al's catalog, you know, it was making good money, very, very good money. And you'd characterize Al's catalog as having 14 or 15 of the most important songs and recordings of the early 60s through to the mid 70s in terms of soul pop music. So everything from Al Green's Let's Stay Together, Call Me, Still In Love With You, seven or eight of Al Green's biggest songs, all the biggest Booker T songs, songs like Tighten Up, you know, uh, uh, you know, just unbelievable stuff. Right. You know, Green Onions, maybe the most famous instrumental of all time, big records with Bill Withers, big records with 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 Otis Redding. And yet 82 percent of the income was concentrated on one song. Let's stay together. 
all of those other incredible songs had been allowed to languish to the point where they were doing nothing. Now we've brought them back to life by managing them. And the concentration of Let's Stay Together on Al's catalog is less than 50%. And the other 50% is now made up of six or seven of those songs that I just mentioned that have been brought back to life because they've had time and attention put into them. That's great to hear. And like I was just saying earlier, I do think it's a really bright future for these catalogs to really flourish. And, you know, unfortunately, it looks like we're coming up to the end of the session here. So I do just have one more question for you, which is what are the next steps for hypnosis? I'm sure you have some big plans and I'd love to learn more about them. Well, we, we continue to acquire amazing catalogs and, you know, there'll be announcements made on a, you know, weekly, monthly, daily basis, you know, as, as we continue, but the company has a ceiling in terms of, of how it'll grow. It's, you know, it's now a, you know, near enough two and a half billion dollar company in the coming couple of years, it'll become a five or $6 billion company. It'll grow from owning the 60,000 songs that it owns now to probably owning as many as 150,000 songs, and the team will grow from the 83 or so that it is today to probably 250 in that period of time. But then it's the perfect size company, right? I, I want to establish song management as the new paradigm. I mean, one of the things that I would say, um, you know, and I'm particularly saying this because I'm dealing with, 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 you know, hopefully a lot of people that are gonna be coming into this business I can tell you now that the best years of the music industry are in front of it, not behind it. But what I can also tell you is that this is a business that is operated under paradigms that have existed for 75 years that are not in the best interest of the artist, the songwriter, or the producer. I'm smashing those paradigms. You can smash those paradigms as well. But the, you know, so the, par the new paradigm that I want to create is the concept of song management where, you know, every songwriter and artist 10 years from now will not only have their manager and their booking agent and their publicist and their record company, but they'll also have their song manager. They may have a publishing administrator as well, but they will have a song manager to make sure that the great works that they create throughout their entire career are being managed properly. Well, Mark, that's great to hear. And I, I look forward to, to actually seeing the, the growth of hypnosis in the coming weeks, months, and, and years ahead. Um, I really appreciate you taking the time to speak with us today. And yeah, I hope we can talk soon. Thank you. It's a pleasure. I wish you all the best. Make some great music. Oh, we